What is up guys, Blue Spooky here with another two hour long mega mix. If you guys end up enjoying this video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe, as it really helps these videos to do well and ensure I can keep making them for a long time in the future. You guys have been really good with the interactions, so I hope we can get to at least 1,500 likes. If you guys have any thoughts about the stories in the video, please be sure to leave them in the comments, as my favorite part about doing the videos is hearing your guys' thoughts on the stories they are in. Without further ado, I will let you guys get right into the next two hours of True Scary Stories, and I will see you guys again at the end of the video. Have a great day. A couple of years ago, I was in between jobs. Honestly, just trying to find myself. Life wasn't the best during this time. I dropped out of school and had been traveling around the country, doing odd jobs here and there. I know that may sound cool, but I wasn't traveling around the country to see the world or anything. I was traveling to find work, and hopefully maybe find my calling along the way. I had no friends, and honestly didn't care about the little bit of family I still had, so I constantly made my way to new towns or cities. The story I'm about to share happened shortly after moving close to a moderately sized town in northern Pennsylvania. Most of the people seemed nice, or at the very least they kept to themselves. It was one of those older coal towns, you know. The buildings were old and almost falling apart, and you could tell from a glance that the town was relatively poor. When I arrived, I noticed there was a restaurant in the heart of town that was doing a crazy amount of business. I have some experience with cooking, and I figured, what the heck? I could always cook again. I went inside, and they hired me almost right away. I worked for about a week, and was feeling pretty good about the situation. I knew it was fast, but I could really see myself settling down in this town. The only problem was, I didn't actually live in the town yet. I lived about 40 minutes away. That wasn't too bad, but when you have a car like mine, it may as well be cross the country. After a couple of weeks, I decided this town was definitely for me. I was going to look for a place to live in town, or at least close by. The hunt for a place wasn't going too great though. It really sucked having to drive home at 3am when the restaurant closed for the day. On my second Saturday there, I got stuck quite late and didn't leave the restaurant until 3.45 in the morning. I was miserable and tired. I just wanted to lie down and go to bed. I started my long drive home and tried to stay awake by blasting some 80s music. The drive wasn't a bad drive, it was just super long. No highways at all, just long stretches of nothing and farmland. About halfway home, I noticed a white Mazda pulled over to the side of the road. Its hazard lights were on, so I started to slow down. As I passed by the vehicle, I noticed a quite petite woman standing next to the door of the car. She was frantically trying to wave me down. I knew I probably should have just kept on driving, but I'd been in that situation before. I figured that I could help a bit. I got out of the car and slowly made my way over to the woman. She instantly jogged over to me and started to thank me over and over again. I asked her what was wrong, and she just kept saying, her tires, her tires. I tried to get her to elaborate on what she meant. Which tires? Was it a flat? She didn't seem to understand what I was saying, really. And that's when I finally got a good look at her. This woman looked, how can I put this nicely? She looked like she'd seen better days. She didn't have a single tooth in her mouth. Her hair was frizzy and wild. Her skin looked like it was flaking off the bones. She must have weighed no more than 80 pounds altogether. Her voice was really deep too, like she'd smoked a pack of cigarettes every day since the day she'd been born. She moved in closer to me, 
and I could smell her terrible B.O. I don't really know how to describe it. I'll just say it certainly wasn't good. I immediately became aware that this may turn into a dangerous situation. I started to slowly back away. I wanted to make a sprint for my car, which was now about 20 feet in front of her Mazda. She must have noticed I was trying to leave, though, because she immediately said, Wait, it's not the tires. Something's wrong with the engine. The car won't run. Oh, uh, maybe I could use your phone? I told her my phone was broken, which of course was a lie. I sure as hell wasn't going to take out my phone and hand it to her. In a weird voice, she then said, Well, maybe you can fix my phone. You look smart. It's right over there in the back of the car. You know how sometimes people do stupid things and you can't quite explain it? Well, I decided to walk over to the back of her car with her at that moment. I don't know if I started feeling bad for her or what, but for some reason she got me to believe her. We got to the back of the Mazda and she whispered, It's right back there. Just open the trunk. I'm too weak to open it. It sticks every time. Every single red flag in my body was shooting up. I finally realized that walking over here was a huge mistake. I turned around and noticed the woman now had both of her hands in her front hoodie pockets. I grabbed the latch of the trunk, thinking about if it was safe to run or not. I didn't know if this woman had a weapon hiding under her hoodie or what. I looked in the back window right before opening the back hatch and saw the unmistakable silhouette of a person inside. I must have made some sort of gasp or noise because while I was frozen in that moment, the woman whispered, Open it now. I finally reached my breaking point. I could clearly see what was about to happen. I turned around and pushed the woman to the ground. As I made a full sprint to my car, I burst open my door and started it right away. I peeled away. As I fled, I looked through the mirror and saw the most terrifying thing I'd ever bared witness to. In the span of like 0.2 seconds, there was a man with a beanie running at my car, and the woman was waving something in her hand. Looked like it may have been a gun, but I couldn't quite be sure since it was so dark. I drove home at 85 miles per hour, even though the speed limit was only 50. When I got there, I was really sweating. I called the police to report what happened on the side of the road. I would have called earlier, but there was no service on those terrible and dark back roads. I don't know for sure what those two intended on doing to me, if they were just planning to rob me or what, but whatever it was was surely not good. I don't know what clicked after that, but shortly after this incident, I moved back to my hometown and just enrolled in community college there. To this day, every time I drive down a dark and desolate road, I'm always reminded of the nightmare from that night. I don't think I'll be forgetting it anytime soon, either. In 2011, my girlfriend lived in California while she finished up her last year of schooling. Earlier in the year, I'd taken a job in New York, so we decided to do the whole long-distance thing for a while. I know it can be hard for many people, but she and I were very career-focused at the time, so we weren't really worried about it that much. I was fortunate enough in my new job to get several weeks of vacation as soon as I signed on. We quickly planned out which weeks worked the best for us. We quickly planned out which weeks worked the best for us and planned for me to come visit accordingly. I used the first two weeks of the four weeks of vacation I got early in the year to visit my girlfriend. I flew down two times and spent the entire time just hanging out with her and spending time in her apartment. Four months later, I used my third week of vacation and flew down to see her again. That flight itself could be its own horrifying story. I don't like flying in general, but this particular one was really bad. The weather was horrible, and the entire time the plane was shaking so bad it felt like it was literally going to explode. When I finally landed at LAX, 
which is the Los Angeles airport for those of you who don't know. I was completely rattled. I couldn't believe I had to get back on a plane in a few days. I spent the first couple of days of the trip pretty anxious. I know it sounds ridiculous, but I really don't like to fly, and this flight had really messed me up. My girlfriend was sort of getting annoyed with me and suggested I just rent a car for the drive home. At first, I shot down the idea, but once I thought about it a bit more, I thought it could be nice to have a cross-country road trip. All alone, listening to some great music, catching up on some old podcasts. After some further thought, I decided I was going to do it. I called up my boss and told him I would be a day late coming back just because the drive was going to take about two days. Thankfully, my boss was really cool with the plan. The rest of the trip went great. Kissed my girlfriend, cuddled, said goodbye, and started my two-day trip back. I was only about 12 hours in, when I realized that maybe I should have just sucked it up and got on a plane back. I was already hurting from driving, and realized quickly that long-distance driving all by myself was not nearly as enjoyable as I'd thought. When I was just driving through long stretches of absolutely nothing, I found it really hard to keep my eyes open. No amount of coffee or energy drinks could keep me awake, and I found myself swerving all over the road, dozing off every few minutes. Thankfully, there was no traffic on these back roads, so my reckless driving was not affecting anybody else. Around this time, I noticed a pull-off section of the road with a rest stop. It wasn't one of those nice ones with food and stuff. It was just a small building with a restroom and about two dozen parking spaces. I figured I would pull into the exit and use the bathroom, maybe shut my eyes for a few minutes then get back on the road later. I didn't like this idea for many reasons. Firstly, because I didn't know if it was illegal to sleep in your car at the rest stop, and honestly, I still really don't. I figured it's called a rest stop for a reason, though, so surely I could get some actual rest there. The second reason, though, was more concerning to me. The place was very creepy. There wasn't a single car or any sign of life anywhere. I guess you could argue that's sort of a good thing, but it was very off-putting to me for some reason. The last reason is I don't really like scary movies, and I'd seen enough of them to scare me for my life in situations like this. Despite all of that, I decided I was just too tired to drive. I locked my doors and set an alarm for two hours. It was just before 2.30 a.m. when I set my alarm. I moved my car to the very last spot in the lot, which was right next to a heavily forested area. I figured if I was far enough away from the restroom and the road, if somebody did pull into the stop, they wouldn't venture to my car. Even though I was terrified of doing this, I ended up passing out almost instantly. Not long after passing out, though, I began to hear a tapping outside my car. I couldn't quite tell if I was dreaming or if there was a bird or something being loud outside. I opened my eyes and didn't see anything except the pitch black darkness all around me. I looked at my phone. Still had 40 minutes until my alarm was supposed to go off. I decided to close my eyes for a little while longer. Right as I closed them though, the tapping began once again. This time, I knew for sure I was not dreaming. I sat up in the driver's seat and really looked at my surroundings through the window. When I turned around, I couldn't believe my eyes. The trunk of my car was wide open, and the tapping sound I was hearing was the wind rocking it back and forth. I felt sick, but tried to rationalize this. I figured since I'd passed out with the keys in my pocket, maybe I'd accidentally hit the trunk button with my leg or something. I stared in that direction for a few moments and saw and heard nothing. At this point, I figured my theory must be correct about the trunk button. I decided I was going to get out and close the trunk myself, then just start my trip again. 
I slowly opened the door, because I was still pretty shaken up at this point. When I started to make my way out of the vehicle, I noticed that my bag, which was in the trunk, was now on the ground behind my car. It was also open. Every instinct in my head in that moment was telling me to get into that car and drive away as fast as I could, but I needed that bag. It had my work computer, my work ID badge, and many other important things. My contacts from my eyes, my medications. I decided to make a run for the bag. As I picked it up, though, I saw someone come sprinting out of the forest toward me. It happened so fast it blew my mind. The person lunged and grabbed me. I assumed he was trying to throw me into my own trunk. In a moment of absolute pure adrenaline, I took my keys from my pocket and jabbed the attacker in the neck with the keys. This momentarily stunned the man, and I was able to throw my bag in the door and jump into my car. He had his face concealed, but by the grunt of pain that he made when I struck him, he sounded to be a middle-aged man. My heart was blasting out of my chest. I started my car, reversed out of the spot as fast as I could, and as I was putting my car into drive, the attacker started running directly at me. I started to accelerate. As I looked up at the bathroom, two more figures were running out, directly at my vehicle as well. One of these figures was fast enough to reach my car and swing at it as I was driving by, leaving a giant dent in the door. I drove for hours. I drove until my gas was just about empty, and I finally stopped and filled up. I drove straight back to New York from there. I only stopped to get gas. I never actually reported the incident, because I didn't exactly know where in God's name I even was. I just knew it was a small rest area on the highway. That night messed me up for a while, and I still don't like driving at night in secluded areas anymore. For a long time, I would think about those attackers and what they planned to do with me. Why were there two hiding in the bathroom, and why hadn't they stolen anything from my bag? It always got my mind going to the darkest corners. Maybe some people are just purely evil. I generally have always despised hiking and being in nature. I've never been overly fond of nature, and I'm a bit of a snob. I'm not afraid to admit it. I hate being too hot, and I hate being too cold as well. My friends literally call me Goldilocks because they say everything needs to be just right or I'll make a big scene. They're sort of right for some things, but hiking is definitely the worst. Trust me when I tell you that I have my reasons, though. Years ago, I dated this guy named Brad. I really loved the guy. He was this big outdoors type. And it took a lot, but I opened myself up to that stuff eventually, so I could do more things with him. I hate to admit this, but I actually started to enjoy some mild ones. Now, of course, those were the types of hikes that real hikers would laugh at. They were perfect for me, though. A few hours outside, nothing too intense. Then I could go home and sleep in my bed at night. About a year into our relationship, Brad begged me to hike this one trail with him on his birthday. I agreed because, like I said, I was starting to come around to the whole outdoors thing. I was admittedly a little bit nervous, though, because his birthday was at the end of October, and it ran the risk of being really cold out. I obviously wasn't a big fan of this. He reassured me that the hike was an incredibly easy one, and it wouldn't be that cold either. He was unfortunately quite wrong. His birthday came around, and it was nasty out. The fog was so thick you could literally barely see in front of your own face. It was a mixture of wet snow and rain, and I was miserable. We started the hike anyway because I was trying my best to be a good girlfriend. I realized a little too late in 
that this was not some easy hike. Brad was looking to push me to a new limit. I was pretty upset about this. We were walking on this really tight walkway, and my foot got caught in something. I fell. I didn't just fall, though. I stumbled badly to the bottom of a pretty steep cliff. I was like a bowling ball, tumbling down the whole way. It hurt really bad, and as I looked down, I could see my leg was definitely broken. In that moment, I was panicking. I didn't know what to do. I could hear Brad screaming from up above, but I couldn't answer him right away. Finally, I shouted up to him and explained what happened. I remember just being happy I was even alive at all. He told me to stay put and that he was going to go get some help, like I could have moved anywhere anyway. The pain was horrible and it seemed like it was getting worse. Not long after he left me, it occurred to me that we were pretty deep into this area. It was going to take him quite a while to get back, find cell service, and get help. Then, somehow the help would have to get to me as well. I started to cry. It all just seemed so impossible. In the time since I'd fallen, the only movement I'd made was pulling myself over to a tree and sitting up against it. I had no idea what time it was. It felt like a long time had passed by, and due to it being late October... The sun had started to set. I got so cold I almost forgot about the pain. If you think that all sounds bad, wait till I tell you how the story gets even worse. Once it started getting dark, it got dark real fast. It was nearly pitch black out. Thankfully, I did have a flashlight I could shine to the cliff when I heard voices, if I ever heard them at this point. I didn't think anybody was ever going to come rescue me. While I was sitting there in pain, though, I started to hear something I was hoping was just my imagination. It sounded like a low growl. I could almost feel the vibration. I turned on my flashlight, and up ahead I saw two glowing eyes. I turned it off and started to sob. It didn't matter what it was. Whatever eyes I'd just seen was most likely something dangerous. The growling was clearly getting closer. I could feel the footsteps on the ground. Even in the darkness, I was able to see what was now only a few feet away from me. It was a large black bear. I didn't know the rules for bears. I didn't know if I should stay still, or if I should scream, or if I should flail my arms around in the air. I ultimately decided to just sit there and whimper. I remember just accepting my own death. I was already in so much pain. The bear got close enough that I could feel its breath on my cheek. I could smell it when it growled. I kept my eyes shut, waiting for it to eat me. I know people talk all the time about how scary certain events in their lives are. Let me tell you though, almost nothing can compare to being stuck at the bottom of a cliff in the dead of night with a broken leg and a bear standing on top of you. The bear stood there for several minutes growling at me. Eventually, it turned into just breathing, and then the bear sat down. I could feel it panting on me. I was trying to imagine it was just a giant dog sitting there, but that wasn't helping at all. Eventually, the bear got up and walked away. I heard it stepping further and further, until I finally breathed a sigh of relief. Not long after, I heard a faint voice coming from the top of the cliff. I shined my light up toward the wall. They had gone a little too far, so they came back to where I fell down. They shined powerful floodlights down on me, and two guys rappelled down like something out of a movie. The next several hours were not pretty. They put my leg into a splint, basically made a makeshift pulley, and lifted me up the cliffside. Every movement brought the worst pain imaginable. I eventually made it out of the woods and to the hospital, where they confirmed my leg was badly broken. It wasn't long after this that I broke up with Brad. I decided in the hospital that I was done with the outdoors. I'd had my brush with death, and I'm good now. I don't know why the bear decided to spare me. Maybe it felt I was pitiful. I'm just happy to be alive to tell you this story, and tell you firsthand that if you don't think you're capable of completing a certain hike, 
Know your limitations and back out. You may not be as lucky as I was. So this was nearly 20 years ago now. Over a few months, all these posters of missing women kept popping up in the neighborhood I lived in and the neighborhoods nearby. One night, we were sitting in a bar. There were probably around 20 people in there total. Everyone was having a really good time. No drama at all, and nothing out of the ordinary. That was when this strange guy came in and sat down. He was wearing regular, unnoteworthy clothing. He didn't talk or say anything strange. He didn't even appear to be acting weird in any way. But for some reason, the whole room instantly went cold. People stopped talking. They began shuffling nervously in their seats. It was like this dark, unrecognizable energy had just entered the room. I remember feeling breathless like I wanted to run away from this guy immediately. Everybody else in the bar seemed to be responding the same way. The guy walked over and asked for a drink. I'd never seen this happen before to a sober customer who hadn't caused any trouble, but the barman turned him away immediately. As soon as the guy left, almost immediately, the atmosphere went right back to what it had been. I walked up to the bar in order to drink myself. I asked why he'd refused to serve the man. We were quite friendly, as I drank there regularly. He said the guy just made him uncomfortable in a way he'd never experienced before. The other people in the bar all chimed in to agree. Thing is, nobody could quite put their finger on why. Well, a couple of weeks later, I was watching the news, and there was a breaking story. Someone had found dismembered limbs in a rubbish bag. The remains belonged to the missing woman, whose photos we'd been seeing for months on end. They showed a photograph of the serial killer they'd caught, and sure enough, it was the very same man from the bar that night. The one who no one could bear to share the room with. I can't explain why, because when he walked in and asked for a simple drink... He didn't really do anything strange, but he brought with him this terrifying, inhumane energy. Sometimes I wonder if he had just killed someone that night, or was planning on killing someone, and that subconsciously gave off the presence of evil we all felt so viscerally that night. This happened a few years ago. I was going through a difficult time, so I was looking for a new place to live without big commitments, at least until I figured life out. I met this guy through a Craigslist posting. He said he had an apartment and was looking for a roommate, so I got his name and number and called him up. I set a meeting at a public place for a meet and greet. Everything went seemingly fine, and he agreed to show me the place. The guy actually seemed really nice and helpful. He was very easy to get along with, neat and low maintenance. It didn't bother me that he was a guy either. We agreed on no drugs, no parties, and no craziness terms. We agreed on monthly payments, and I moved in a few weeks later. It was after two weeks, when one day he came in early from work. In this very clearly upset voice, he claimed that we needed to talk. He said I'd been acting inappropriately by having my boyfriend stop by on occasion. It was not even to spend the night or stay or anything like that. He would only stop by for ten minutes every now and then to see me. I began questioning him. He said it made him feel uncomfortable because everyone at the apartment complex thought I was his romantic partner. I was furious. I couldn't believe that bullshit. It then escalated to a point when he said the entire time he had known me, which was about two weeks with very limited interaction, plus the fact I worked night shift so he was by himself most of the time when he was home. He was convinced that I was possessed. He said he could see it in my eyes. 
I knew at this point the shit had hit the fan, and I needed to get as far away from this guy as I could. He acted all calm, and said he wasn't sure our arrangement could continue to work. Yeah, you think? I told my boyfriend what happened. I found an apartment I could move into, and planned to do it the very next day. I told my insane roommate as well. The day of my moving came. I walked into the apartment to get my stuff. I was surprised to see a wooden cross above my room's door frame with a cliché Jesus Christ on it. I walked into my room, and there were seance candles lit all inside. I packed up my belongings and left. He sent a message to me later, which said something about God giving him a message, and how he was going to make me face my sins and darkness one day. I blocked the creep's number after that. I trust people a lot less now, and I would never have a roommate again. That was the first time ever in my life that I even had one. And look at how crazy that got in just two weeks. Autumn is an amazing season. I love the way the leaves change on the trees. I love all the activities in the fall, like hiking, apple picking, pumpkin picking, and even celebrating Halloween. October holds a very special place in my heart, because that's when my husband and I got married. This October will already be our 15th wedding anniversary. As great as all of that is, the story I want to share with you today is not such a great memory. Really more of a horrible nightmare that nearly ruined this time of year for me altogether. We had just celebrated our first wedding anniversary the weekend prior. The next weekend, we planned on taking it easy and having a fun and relaxing afternoon. We decided to go out pumpkin picking since it was a beautiful day and we both had the day off from work. We spent a few hours down at the pumpkin patch. It was one of those big ones that had a ton to do, so it wasn't like we were just walking around picking pumpkins the entire time. We watched the live band, grabbed some hot beverages and apple cider donuts, and had a great time. We were just about getting ready to leave, but I could tell my husband wasn't quite ready to call it a day yet. I asked him if there was anything else he wanted to do before we headed home. He smiled and asked if we could go for a little hike. Something to know about me is that I'm not the biggest fan of hiking myself. I don't mind being outside, but the idea of trekking through the woods with bugs and wild animals is just not really my thing. I know my husband loves that sort of thing, though, so he suggested visiting a local site right nearby. We were already out that way, roughly an hour away from where we lived. I agreed to his suggestion, since I already knew which site he was talking about. It wasn't that intense of a hike. We left the pumpkin patch and headed for our autumn hike at around 2 in the afternoon. We planned on heading home at around 3.30, when we returned to the parking lot, though, I could see that my husband was a bit upset. The park was closed for some sort of renovations, I guess. It had a big sign up that said they'd be open next May. Instead of turning around in the parking lot, he parked and told me we had to check out the sign up close first. As we were walking to the start of the trail, he pointed out there were several other cars parked in the lot. His logic was that even though the park itself was closed, we could probably still walk on the trails just fine. Anyway, he started to nudge me a little bit and said we should just check out the first bit of the trail. He kept pointing to all the other cars and saying that other people were there as well. I gave up the argument and told him we could check out the first few minutes, but then I wanted to leave right away. I could tell he was very excited. This type of rule-breaking, though not very serious, was out of character for us. We had to jump this chain-link fence to get onto the trail and pass through a bunch of construction equipment. I was already regretting my decision, 
No trespassing signs were everywhere. I was fully expecting to be either confronted by a worker or even a police officer. A few minutes into the walk, my husband pointed out a little shack off the trail a bit. It wasn't like an old abandoned shack, though. The opposite, really. It was this strange little building that was clearly brand new. Most likely some sort of break room for the workers or something. My husband wanted to check it out, though, so the string of bad decisions continued. As we approached the building, my husband pointed out to me that it was portable. I'd never seen anything like that before. Honestly, it was pretty cool. He explained to me it was almost like a trailer. It didn't have any plumbing or AC, but was a sturdy structure to eat and take a break from the elements. When we were only about 10 feet away, we could hear muffled voices on the inside of the structure. Not wanting to bring attention to ourselves, we decided just to move quickly toward the building instead of away. I know that sounds backward, but we were walking toward the front door. If we turned around and ran, it would for sure bring attention to ourselves. And that's why we sort of ducked and moved to the side of the building. We wanted to figure out how to get away without being caught. You know, I thought right away that we were done for. I assumed that it was either construction crew inside this building or a park ranger. While we were hiding on the side of it, my husband was motioning for me to be quiet while he tried to listen in. He's considerably taller than me, so he practically had his ear on the window. I was too short to reach, so I couldn't hear what they were saying. I could only make out the muffled tones of the voices. They sounded really angry. My husband then made a decision to cup his hands and look through the window. In all the years I've known him, I've never seen the expression that he made that day. I watched the colors sort of run away from his face, and seconds later he ducked down as quick as possible. I could see fear in his eyes, but even worse than that, I could hear terror in his voice. He looked at me, with his voice shaking, and said, We need to go right now. He grabbed my arm and guided me as we ran back to the trail and back to our car. I barely had the door shut on my side, and he was already speeding out of the parking lot. He continued checking his rearview mirror every few seconds the entire drive home. I kept asking him what scared him so bad, but he wouldn't tell me. Clearly, it was not just a worker or an officer, because his reaction would not be like this. When we got home, he immediately went back outside and called the police. He went as far as sitting in his car so I wouldn't hear him. The worst part of this all, though, is that I still don't know what he saw that afternoon. He begged me to stop asking and made me promise I would never bring it up again. After a little battle, I finally agreed. All these years later, I still don't know. I've remained true to my word by not asking him. Believe it or not, this story gets even worse. Whatever he saw when he looked in that day affected him so badly that he hasn't slept right ever since then. He refuses to talk to anybody about it, and he's learned to live with his messed up sleep cycle. He blames his insomnia on work and stress, but it started very clearly after that incident. Every night he gets in bed with me, but once I'm asleep he'll get up and sit in the living room all night long. He won't turn the TV on or play video games, won't even read a book. He just sort of faces the door and remains there until he eventually passes out on the couch or his alarm goes off. Whatever happened that afternoon, I just hope that someday my husband finds the peace of mind that he deserves. Every year around this time, I take a week or so off work to plan some solo activities to clear my mind, try to manage and reset my anxiety. One night, I might order a pizza and binge some of my favorite horror films. The next, I might go to a local farm and pick some apples. 
One thing I make sure to do every year, though, is go out for a hike. I take the time to enjoy the fresh air and see the trees as they go from green to orange, yellow, and burgundy. I usually frequent the same trails and the same areas. Three years ago, though, I had a fellow outdoors enthusiast recommend me a hike about 45 minutes away from my home. He was very honest and transparent that this was not a marked trail. He said there were definite signs of frequent foot travel, though. He had placed some markers when he went and suggested that I bring some as well, just for safety and to make sure I did not get lost. I decided to venture it alone, but made sure that my parents and significant other at the time knew that I would be hiking just in case I did get lost, or they hadn't heard from me in a while. The aforementioned friend, who we'll call Justin, gave me specific instructions including mile markers of where I could find the entrance to the forest. He also gave me recommendations of where I could leave my car. I found what I thought was the right area. I put on the rest of my gear and threw my backpack on and started to head in. I could see what Justin mentioned immediately. Although there was no official signage, there was a very clear path in the dirt and grass that would help to guide you along your way. I'd brought these small flags to mark the path with. They had small crosses on them. I did notice some other markings along the path, but nothing else I could really attribute to a pattern that I could follow to make my way back. I began walking slowly, admiring the foliage, the air, and the nature around me. Before I knew it, I had spent an entire hour and hadn't moved very far at all. I decided to press onward, making sure to mark my path and acknowledge major milestones along the way. I tried to place my markers near big trees and logs to make it quite obvious on my way back. I remember thinking about my current problems in life and how they were affecting my stress levels. I like to use nature as a way to move past them and identify positive next steps to help me solve these problems. Before I knew it, I was becoming both mentally and physically fatigued. I decided I would sit down for a few minutes, grab some water and a snack, and then head back to my car. While I was sitting and having a sip of water, though, I noticed that all of a sudden, everything had gone completely silent. The humming and buzzing of nature had ceased. I made a noise out loud to make sure I hadn't gone deaf or something. I heard the sound I made, and then, a moment later, the other sounds around me picked back up again. I remember thinking to myself how strange that was. I really needed to get down some water and make sure I wasn't dehydrated. My walk back began pretty normal. I observed the flags I had posted to mark my way back through the trail. After each one, I identified the landmarks I'd remembered and tried to gauge how far away I was from the exit. About halfway through, though, I started to become very confused. The flags were now quite obviously in locations where I hadn't placed them before. One was stuck to a tree. Another one after that was smack dab in the middle of the path. I tried to recall back in my memory. I was absolutely certain I hadn't put these here. I didn't know what else to do but to try and continue to press forward with eyes wide open, looking for any markings that were familiar. The more I traveled, though the less familiar things seemed to look. I took out my phone and pressed the car alarm on the app for my vehicle. I couldn't hear anything at all. It wasn't that late in the day, but for those of you reading this, you know it can be much darker in the forest than it is outside. I noticed that the frequency of my markers were picking up as well. They were coming one after another, and after 50 minutes of walking... I noticed three right next to each other, sitting outside of a big rock covered in moss. As I got closer, though, I noticed it was not a rock at all. It was something resembling an odd-shaped shed that had been overgrown with vegetation. As I realized what it was, 
I started to back away. I heard a noise that sounded like a loud crack, followed by a faint squeaking door opening. All I could see was a hand sticking out of the shed's door. More specifically, a finger making a motion gesturing me to come closer. Needless to say, I immediately turned in the other direction and started running as fast as I could. I ran for a good 10 to 15 minutes and tried to catch my breath. I tried to use my phone to see if I could hear my car again. Thank God I could actually hear my alarm this time, ever so slightly. I made my way toward the sound as it got louder and louder. Eventually, I stumbled out of the woods and found it. I immediately got in and locked the doors. I got onto the road and drove until I came across the first rest stop. I put the car into park and tried to make sense of what exactly I'd just experienced. To this day, I still don't quite know how to process it. The only rational explanation is that someone found my markers and placed them to lead me specifically to that area. Perhaps it was someone playing a joke. Or maybe it was someone with more sinister intentions. Part of me thinks that maybe I was under so much stress that I imagine seeing the gesturing finger, but I have no history of hallucinations. Either way, I don't hike alone anymore, and I always make sure to stick to public and well-established trails just in case. When I was 16 years old, my parents made me go to a summer camp and was several hours away from my hometown. Yeah, that's right, I said they made me go. At the time, I started some extracurricular activities that were bringing my grades down, and ultimately got me into some legal trouble. It was right at the end of the school year, too. To keep a watchful eye on me and make sure I wasn't doing anything illegal, my parents assumed sending me to a camp would fix the issue. I hated it. At the time, I resented my parents. Now, I realize over a decade later that my parents were just trying to help and didn't understand the best course of action. This was one of those camps that lasted the entire length of the summer. It was almost like a boarding school, really but instead of schooling, you were doing more outdoor activities and campish type things. You could send your child there for an entire summer or just a week, depending on how much you wanted to pay. I was able to compromise with my parents, and we agreed I could go for just three weeks. I was miserable on the car ride up there. I was thinking about all my friends, hanging out with the girl I liked, and most importantly at the time, my precious Xbox 360. One thing I noticed right away as we actually arrived was the lack of campers my age. This camp had a ton of junior high kids and only a few high schoolers like me. In my cabin where I slept was a group of seven other guys, at least somewhat close to my age. These were mostly outdoorsy type kids, they loved hiking, making s'mores, everything about camping, really. So I was the outsider right away. All my cabin mates were returning campers that had been coming here for years on end. They told me right away I would grow to love the place, and my shy and negative demeanor would wear off eventually. I didn't believe that for one second, though. Never been much of a kumbaya sort of guy. That's why I never got into sports or any team activities. As far as I was concerned, these three weeks were basically a jail sentence, and all I needed to do was serve my time until I was allowed to go home. The first five or six days, I did just that. I kept to myself and only did the mandatory activities. Most of the time, I just spent it in the common room. It was a big cabin in the center of camp that had a pool table, a bunch of books, and most importantly, was very quiet. 
The other campers spent their days and afternoons out swimming, hiking, and doing all sorts of activities the camp provided. Toward the end of my first week, though, my cabin mates suggested I go swimming with them. I say suggested, but they basically strong-armed me into going. I was reluctant since I wasn't fond of my cabin mates or anything about this camp. It was pretty hot out though, so I went anyway. I was kind of shocked to admit to myself that it was actually a really good time. This is when camp started to feel less like a jail and more like something to have fun with. I honestly couldn't believe it. After that afternoon, I don't think I ever went back to the common room. I spent my time with my cabin mates and even met a nice girl named Amy. Being the older kids at the camp, we had a much stronger relationship with the counselors. I appreciated that they didn't just treat us like children and talk to us respectfully and professionally. The last weekend of my stay there came before I knew it, and I was kind of upset to leave. I almost couldn't admit it to myself, but it really was the truth. My parents were coming to pick me up on Sunday afternoon. Because of this, my cabin mates and I agreed that Friday and Saturday night, we were going to go out of our way to make the most memorable weekend. Since I was the quote-unquote bad guy of the group, I stole a bunch of snacks, and we loaded up our cabin. We were going to stay up all night, hanging out, playing card games, and doing whatever. Ordinarily, I would suggest something like sneaking out or something like that, but I didn't really want to do anything crazy. Just wanted to hang out with all my new friends a little bit. After midnight or so, a few of the guys had fallen asleep. Four of us were still up playing blackjack, using some mini candy as betting chips. All of a sudden, one of my friends who was lying down in bed jumped up erratically and shouted out, Whoa, what the heck was that? His sudden movement and sharp tone caused us all to be a little startled. We asked him what was wrong. He paused for a moment and stared out the windows. I swear, I just saw someone out in that tree out there. We made eye contact and he jumped down. We all laughed thinking he was being an idiot. The windows aren't like normal windows. Across the top of the cabin where the walls meet the ceiling, there was one long window that went around the entire perimeter. He got upset and even had tears in his eyes. He insisted this was no joke. One of my friends doubted him, claiming there was no way you could see out the windows of the cabin, especially at this hour. He began to disagree and told us to lie down on his bed and stare up too. I was surprised to see he was right. You could actually see the trees out the window. I was looking for the one he'd pointed out in particular, and I thought I made out a face. I know that sounds crazy, but I just kept staring in that spot. I didn't say anything, because I wasn't quite sure what I was seeing. I started to focus in a little more, and I realized it really was a face. Someone was staring right at me. When my eyes got wider in surprise, he jumped down. I even heard his feet hit the ground. One of my friends suggested we go outside and look to see if the dirt below the tree had footprints or something. Two friends and I made our way outside. We didn't even make it to the tree when we noticed that standing right beside the cabin hiding was a person. We stopped abruptly. The man heard us and looked over with one of the most horrifying faces I'd ever seen. He ran off into the woods, waving his arms back and forth. We all ran as fast as we could back to the cabin. We were shouting, but not loud enough for the counselors to hear us. Instead of waking them up, for some reason we decided to deliberate on the situation and figure out the best course of action. Before reaching a decision, all of a sudden, one of the counselors ran into our cabin and shut the door. He immediately locked it. He was extremely tense. He yelled at us to turn our lights off and get into our beds. We tried to ask him what was wrong, telling him what we'd seen, but he just ignored us. A few minutes later, we saw the lights of park ranger trucks. The counselor ran out to speak to the rangers, 
and seconds later, all the other counselors were there as well. One of the rangers was a blonde woman. I couldn't hear what any of them were saying, but the counselor looked erratic and nervous. He was shouting at the ranger. She pointed to the forest and nodded. Then the rangers got into the trucks and started to drive away. The counselors all stayed out in the center of the cabins, talking for a few minutes. Each one of them eventually went to the various cabins and told us it was a false alarm and that we just needed to go to bed. We were furious. We wanted to know what was going on. Did it have anything to do with what we'd just seen? Instead of answering us, they told us to shut up and told us it was nothing. Nobody was out there. We didn't sleep well that night. Honestly, nothing really happened the next day. I tossed and turned all night on Saturday night. Sunday morning soon came, and my parents came to pick me up. I told them about the strange thing that happened. They asked the camp director, who said that one of the campers was playing a prank and trying to scare people. Apparently, one of the counselors thought it was a real threat and called the rangers in. The director assured my parents it was simply a false alarm and that there was nothing to worry about. But I knew that wasn't true. That was no camper I saw that night. I made out the man's face and figure clearly, and even though it was dark, that man was at least in his early 40s. To this day, I'm still friends with the guys from the cabin. Just recently, we all caught up and reminisced about that night. Every single one of them remembers it the exact same way as I do. I don't know what exactly occurred, and I don't know who that guy was or what he wanted. But I do know he was not someone who worked there, and he was not a camper either. I don't know why the camp refused to admit anything. Maybe it was bad publicity. Either way, that was one of the most horrifying nights of my life, and I'll never forget the deranged look on that creep's face. I've always loved camps and summer camps, even stemming back to movies like Heavyweights or Camp Nowhere that I watched before I even attended any summer camp. There's a popular one here in the Northeast that I started attending when I was around 12 or 13 years old. We had a family friend that worked there and was able to give my parents a big discount. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to afford to send me. I attended that camp almost every summer during my teenage years, creating great memories and friendships that lasted a very long time. Once college came along, I took a break over the summer to do some internships that were required for graduation. I was also working part-time at a local grocery store to make some actual money to do things with friends, pay for a cell phone, etc. After graduation, the first thing I wanted to do was find a new job. I'd had enough of retail work for the rest of my life and wanted to try and find something different. I got a few interviews, but I was unable to land anything concrete. June rolled along and my parents had that same family friend over for dinner that still worked at the same summer camp. My parents mentioned that I had been looking for a job, and she said, well, why don't you come work at the camp then? We're always looking for help, and I could put in a good word. I thought, sure, why not? Beats the hell out of scanning and bagging groceries and putting carts away. I had a very informal interview over the phone, basically talking about myself and my experiences as a kid at the camp. They basically gave me the job on the spot, because after just a few questions, they said I would work two weeks and could either go home for a week or stay and work through while the session changed over. Campers could stay between sessions as well. But at this camp, the main sessions were two-week overnights. I decided I would work two weeks, then take a week off. If it went well, I would consider staying during the shift week to make some extra money. Honestly, the job was really easy. I wasn't really even a counselor. I helped out more in the kitchen, 
or with some of the outdoor activities, and really just kind of floated around to whichever area needed me. I had made it through almost the entire summer without any incidents. I hadn't messed up on the job, all the kids were very pleasant, and we hadn't had any major issues either. Since we were counselors, we had our own living quarters and places to sleep. The counselors and co-counselors stayed in the box, where some of the other workers had a little more freedom. Other workers in similar positions to mine lived close enough to just go home each day. I remember one night, in I think August, it was especially hot. I was having some trouble sleeping. I couldn't get comfortable no matter what I would do, and I was tossing and turning for hours. I decided to get up, grab some water, and pop outside to see if the night air would be any more refreshing. I ducked out the main door quietly and was relieved at how nice the night air felt. It was much more comfortable than inside. I took a few sips of water and started looking up at the night sky, and then I noticed something out of my peripheral vision. There was something flashing outside one of the bunks. It was almost like something was blocking or shaking the light outside one of the cabins. I started to move a bit closer and saw something outside the door under the light. At first, I thought maybe it was a raccoon. I even remember thinking, please tell me it's not a baby bear. As I got closer though, I saw it was a kid. A little boy. He was pointing at the light and waving his arm up and down, all the while still pointing. Hey there, buddy. You okay? I whispered. He kept pointing at the light, then every ten seconds or so, slowly moving his arm up and down. Is this your bunk? I said. Still nothing. Okay, kid, let's go inside and get some sleep now. And the boy obliged and headed inside with me. I woke up the co-counselor. Hey, uh, there's a kid outside your bunk. He could have easily wandered off. He was surprised. How do you even get outside? I shrugged and said I don't know. He looked annoyed and said he'd talk to someone tomorrow and see what happened. I remember walking off annoyed and upset. I didn't know the rules completely yet, but I knew there were training and safeguards to make sure the campers were safe at all times. Clearly, some type of protocol had been bypassed for a camper to be out at night unattended. The next day was really busy. The incident left my mind briefly until I headed over to the main building with some arts and craft supplies for a project the kids would be working on. When I got to the art room, there were a few kids finishing up some projects, getting ready to head down the hall to eat. I saw the same boy from last night. This time, he was standing in the corner, his face looking directly at the wall. I looked over at one of my co-workers and asked her what was going on. She said the kid wouldn't respond to anything. I walked over to the corner and leaned down to whisper to him, Hey buddy, you remember me? What do you say we go and grab something to eat together? No response, but I noticed it wasn't completely silent either. I could hear something like whispers, like someone was talking, but I couldn't make out the words. As I drew closer, it got a bit louder. I could see the boy's mouth moving and his eyes closed. He was whispering very fast and low. I tapped him on the shoulder and he jumped up with a huge smile on his face. Hi, I'm Timmy, he said. He turned away from the wall and started skipping toward the door to head to the cafeteria. Another day passed by and I was up out of bed early, just like every morning. I usually would take a walk before I showered. I liked to be up before the day got too busy and everyone was up and using the facilities. This morning, a lot of my co-workers were already up and outside. They were all huddled together talking to one another. I slowly walked over to them and said, Wow, you guys are up early today. Yeah, we didn't get much sleep. One of Alexander's campers had to go home in the middle of the night. He had some sort of episode, freaked out a lot of the other campers. A few of them got picked up by their parents as well. It was all the talk of the camp for the next few days, with stories playing the game of telephone and becoming more and more exaggerated. One thing I did hear clearly from a senior counselor, though, 
that I was never able to confirm myself is that there were some kind of scratches or carvings under the little boy's bunk, and he decided to replace a few of the boards as well. I think it all may have been camp gossip, not actually real. I haven't been back there in years, but every now and again I think about it, all the good memories that I made, and I wonder about that story. I wonder what was really going on with that little boy. Several years ago when I was broke, I moved to a new city for a job. This job was not the most well-paying job, but it was very decent. I had no money going into it though, so I had to find a cheap place to live. I ended up going onto Craigslist and finding a roommate there. I know that sounds sketchy, and the truth is that it is. The guy that I was roommates with was extremely weird. At first, he seemed normal enough, but I'd never actually met him in person until I actually moved into the apartment. We had a two-bedroom place, and it was right outside of the city. My roommate's name was Kevin. He was thin, had longer hair, and was about my age. The apartment we shared was not very nice. It was not located in the best neighborhood, and the building was old and a bit run down. We had a living room, a small kitchen, and a hallway, where Kevin's room was at one end. The bathroom was sort of across from Kevin's room, and my room was at the other end of the hallway. I knew that living with Kevin would be a temporary measure, and as soon as I had enough money to move to a better place, I would. After moving in with Kevin, he got a little bit more strange. He was not that friendly, and for the most part stayed out of my way. Well, that was nice enough. I stayed out of his, too. Kevin seemed to be a really private guy, and didn't have much interest in being friends or anything. That was just fine with me. One thing he did, though, was that he would always forget to lock the main door of our apartment. There were five different times where I knew I locked the door, and then would see it unlocked later. I tried to talk to him about it once, and he kind of blew me off. It made me mad, honestly. Many times, I remember I would get up to use our bathroom, which was right across from Kevin's room. I would have to walk by his door to use it. Kevin would be in his bedroom, and whenever I would walk past, I would literally hear him locking his own door, like he was afraid I was going to try and go into his room. He could lock that, but he refused to lock the main door for some reason. I never once tried to enter his room, never even knocked on his door. It was so annoying. I would like to have the front door locked at all times. Luckily, my own bedroom also had a lock on it as well. One night, I was sleeping, but woke up in the middle of the night. The first thing I remember after waking up is that I heard someone right outside my bedroom door. My heart started racing. I didn't know what to do. Whoever this person was was already inside the apartment, probably because Kevin had left the door unlocked once more. I then heard this noise like somebody was tampering with the lock on my door, perhaps trying to pick it. This went on for about a minute, but luckily they were unable to get inside. I grabbed the phone that was next to my bed and called the police right away. Then I turned on my bedroom light. When this happened, I heard whoever it was outside moving away from the door and seemingly back out toward the living room. I didn't leave my room until the police arrived. By then, I hadn't heard anything in quite a long time. Eventually, I left my bedroom and saw our front door had indeed been left unlocked again. The police came in and searched the place. While this was going on, Kevin came out of his bedroom, apparently having woken up by the commotion. He said he didn't see or hear anything. The police didn't find anybody and nothing was stolen or missing. I even remember when the police were there, Kevin loudly said, Are you sure you weren't dreaming the whole thing? Needless to say, I found that a bit rude. I knew I was not. The police also heard him, 
and I didn't want them to think I was just imagining the whole thing. They advised us to keep the door locked, and then left pretty soon after. After they left, I remember Kevin asking me why I'd called the police. It was like he was annoyed I'd done so. I said it was because he'd left the door unlocked, and somebody had broken in. Kevin claimed he did not leave it unlocked, and said our lock must be faulty, but I didn't believe him. I mean, somebody broke into our apartment and tried to get into my bedroom. Kevin just seemed to be annoyed by the whole thing. Didn't even seem that concerned. After we both went back to our rooms, I went to bed. I really couldn't wait to move out of there. Soon enough, I would have enough money saved up to do so. Several days went by and everything seemed to be perfectly normal. One night, I was in my bedroom again. Usually, I would hang out in my bedroom, then go to the bathroom, brush my teeth, return and lock my door, then go to sleep. That was my nightly routine I had. On this night, I believe a Friday because I didn't have work the next morning, I stayed up much later than usual, watching YouTube videos on my phone. It was past the time I usually went to sleep, I think just about after midnight. I was laying on my bed and my lights were out, but my door was unlocked because I hadn't brushed my teeth yet. I remember all of a sudden, seeing my bedroom door start to open. My headphones were in, so I didn't hear anything. When I saw this though, I took them out and looked up to the door. After it slowly opened, I saw Kevin entering. When he saw me staring right at him, he immediately stopped, turned around, and fled the room. I yelled at him, asking what he wanted, but he returned to his own room. I thought this was really weird, and also more than a little bit creepy. I got up, brushed my teeth, and locked my door, then went to bed. The next day, I asked Kevin what he was doing, and he completely denied it even happened. I couldn't believe it when he suggested I was having another dream. It really made me mad. I didn't say anything, though. Instead, I recognized it was probably him that very first night I'd called the police. I don't think anybody else entered our apartment at all. I mean, nothing was stolen, and nothing was messed up. Plus, the person went straight for my room. I started looking for a new place that same day, and within a week, I moved out. Ever since then, I haven't seen or heard from Kevin again, and I'm hoping I never have to either. This is the story of my freshman year in college. I went to a smaller university, where there were only a few thousand students that attended. The campus wasn't very large, but I sort of liked that about this place. My first year, I had to live in the dorms, though, to save a little bit of money and perhaps make a friend or two. I chose to have a random roommate assigned to me. This decision really backfired. I didn't know anybody at the college when I got there, and the first person I met was my roommate. He told me his name was Joe. Joe was a very strange guy overall. He was rude, unfriendly, and never left his room other than to go to class. He was not at all the type of person I would normally hang out with. By the second week, I had given up all hope of being friends with him. I had a TV and a PS4 that I brought to school, and Joe said I could never use it because it bothered him. He demanded that all the lights be off after dark, and no electronics at all. I tried to reason with him, but he threatened to report me to the Dean of Students. I wasn't scared by the threat since I didn't really think they would do anything, but I would rather try and get along with my roommate instead of making a new enemy. I would do my studying in class buildings around campus. I made other friends at college pretty quickly, and when I was talking with them about Joe, they suggested that I get a new room. I hadn't even realized that was an option until they told me to consider it. I put in a request to get my own solo dorm room. I was told that when one came available, they would contact me about two weeks later. Now, about a month and a half into the school year, 
I was contacted and told I could move into a different dorm building that was right across the street. This building was a little newer, a little nicer. It had a room that was available, so I accepted it. I decided to not even tell Joe. I didn't know if he would be happy or sad, but I didn't want him thinking I hated him or something. One day, when Joe was gone at his classes, at a time that I didn't have class, I packed up all my things and left without saying a single word. My entire half of the room was now gone. I moved into my new building, got my new room. It was so nice to finally have a place all to myself. I could watch my TV, play my PlayStation, not have any complaints. I could even have my friends come over to hang out with me. I did want to be careful not to see my old roommate Joe, though. Like I said, it was a very small campus, so there was a chance we would cross paths. If we did, I didn't want him to confront me on why I left or something. I was very careful to avoid him, and didn't see him at all for a couple of days. As for my new room, at first it was great, but on probably the second or third night there, something happened. I was playing video games late at night, when I suddenly heard someone try to open my door. It was locked, so of course it didn't open. After a few seconds, I got up to look out my peephole. As I was walking toward the door, I heard somebody begin knocking on it. There weren't a lot of people who even knew that I lived here yet, so I found this really strange. When I got to the door, I saw Joe just standing there. I did not want to answer it. I quietly moved away from the door, and he kept on knocking. I still didn't answer. I was really creeped out now. I mean, how the hell did he even know that I lived here? I didn't tell him, and I wasn't friends with him on anything where he could see my location. This was really strange. I went back and looked about ten minutes later, and he was finally gone. I didn't know why he'd even come. There was no reason that I could think of. Well, the next morning, I got up and had to go to class. When I left my room, I walked down a couple of hallways to get to the front of the building. In one of the hallways was a sort of lounge study area. As I was approaching it, I saw Joe sitting in one of the chairs there. I couldn't believe he was in my dorm building. He didn't live here, so he had no reason to be here. I turned around and left out another exit. I thought maybe he was following me. It was really strange. Later on in that same day, I was walking around campus, and I happened to notice him again. I saw him a ways behind me. I walked back to my dorm building, and he seemed to follow me there. He wasn't walking close enough to follow me inside or anything, but it was very suspicious behavior. When I got back in the building, I was wondering what the hell this guy's problem was. The same night, he was back at my room once more. I was up late, and he tried entering again. It was locked, like always, so he started knocking on the door. This time, it was much louder than before. I didn't answer. I just watched him through the peephole. He knocked over and over very loudly, but I still did nothing. After a while, somebody else who lived down the hall opened their door and told them to shut up. Joe didn't say anything. He just stood there for a minute. After that, he backed up a step and kicked my door. I was honestly afraid it might break in with how hard he kicked it. It didn't budge, though. He turned and stormed off. After this, I made up my mind. I was going to report him. The next day, I did. Somebody must have talked to him or something, though, because I stopped seeing him after that, and he did not return to my room. I was still very suspicious he would follow me around or show up again or something. Luckily, he never did. A while after this, I met somebody that used to know him. They weren't really his friend, but had several classes with him. They told me he had dropped out and also said his name wasn't even Joe at all. None of that really surprised me, though. I'm not sure why he gave me a fake name at all, but he really was a strange guy. Looking back, I'm really glad I moved out when I did.
I was kidnapped last year. I'm a musician, and an acquaintance came to my show. They said my set sounded great, and stuck around for a bit. We had a good time, and they offered me a ride home, which I accepted. I got into his car, and we started off. But at some point, he started heading in the wrong direction. All of a sudden, he turned toward me, and started screaming at me. Bitch, you don't know whose car you just got into. He started calling me names, slurs, and cussing at me as well. He told me he was going to cut me open and leave my body on the side of the road. He was going to stomp my face into the dirt so no one would ever recognize me. He pulled out a knife on me. At that point, it started raining. He turned off his headlights and began driving erratically, screaming about how he was going to crash the car and kill us both. We soon came upon a red light, and I tried to get out. He slammed the gas through the red light, screaming about how I was such an idiot, and I just didn't get it yet. He was going to make sure I went to hell, but first we were going to purgatory. This went on for an hour until he pulled down a random dirt road into the woods and went completely silent. As he parked the car, I got out and tried to run. I ran out into the woods and eventually emerged into someone's yard. I had to crawl underneath their deck to hide. I had my phone and used my GPS to figure out where I was and tried to locate the train station. My acquaintance texted me, saying he was going to find me, and then he was going to make it so much worse. Eventually, I had to emerge from my hiding place and made it to the train station a few hours later. While I was walking, I was terrified of every approaching car. I feared it might be him. I cut through people's yards, hid behind bushes, and ran through open fields. I was almost at the train station, when a random car pulled up next to me. I was soggy from the rain and beyond exhausted. At this point, it was almost 4.30 a.m. The random guy rolled down his window and did the usual, Hey, beautiful, want a ride? I didn't even look at him. I told him to fuck off. Eventually, I made it home just fine, but that was the scariest experience of my entire life. I currently work at Starbucks, and I've been working there for a little over a year. This is something that took place last summer, and it was a crazy experience to say the very least. It all happened one very busy morning. I had been working since we opened, but at this point it was probably a little bit after 8am or so. Lots of people were filtering in and ordering their own things. There were five of us working trying to keep up with the rush. We were doing a pretty good job, I thought. Some people order Starbucks online and pick it up, or use things like DoorDash or Uber Eats. Between those people and the people ordering in-store, there were several drinks on the counter. I remember seeing at least five, and a couple of food items. A few people were standing around waiting for their orders to be done as well. We didn't have a separate shelf for mobile and online orders at the time. We've since added it. Every order that was done back then, though, just got placed onto the counter. I remember as I put a drink down, I noticed one guy walking in. He had very long hair and a beard that was extremely unkempt. I turned around to keep working, as we were very busy and short on time. A short time later, another order got added to the counter, and a couple of people picked theirs up. I saw the man was now standing nearby. Five minutes later, I added another drink to the counter, which now had six or seven things on it. That's when I saw the man start walking up. At first, I assumed he had ordered something online and was picking it up. But after the guy got right up to the counter, he took his arm and just knocked everything over, used it like a brush. 
Within seconds, every single drink that was on there got knocked over and spilled onto the floor. I couldn't believe he'd just randomly do this. The man took a step back and started laughing like a maniac. A bunch of people around him gave him dirty looks, and somebody asked him why he did that. The place quickly became dead silent. He just kept laughing, as if it was the funniest thing he had ever seen. I was angry, but I knew I couldn't lose my temper. For some reason, I took it upon myself to deal with the situation, probably because I was closest to the man. I took a few steps over to the guy, and he looked at me. Before I could say anything, the man said to me, What are you gonna do about it? As if he was very proud of what he had done. I asked him to just leave. The guy said no. I thought he must be crazy or something. Some other people were telling him he should leave as well. He turned back to them and started arguing. I went back to help another order we were finishing up. Then we were going to try to figure everything out that needed to be remade. Thirty seconds later, I heard the man moving closer. I looked over and saw him jumping the counter. I moved over to him and told him to stop. The man was now facing me and standing behind the counter which was for employees only. I told the man to leave again. He wasn't going to listen though. He grabbed something off the shelf. It was a container of caramel or something. He threw it right at my face. I was afraid of what the man would do next. He seemed very unpredictable. Somebody shouted to call the police. All of a sudden, the man charged at me. He wasn't very big. I was several inches taller than him. He ran right into me, but didn't have enough force to knock me over. I put my hands up and shoved him, and he fell over. He crashed right into the counter behind us. I remember he was on the ground and began yelling that he was going to sue me for assaulting him. A lot of people started leaving the building, and nobody was trying to get coffee anymore. As the man stood up, I told him to just leave right now before it got any worse. He refused. He charged at me again. I grabbed the man by his arms and tried to force him to leave. I walked him out and around the counter. I heard one of my co-workers say the police were on the way. Everybody who was inside left, and as I made it out from behind the counter, the man broke free from me. Obviously, I wasn't going to try to tackle him or anything. He ran over to a table and stood behind it. All of my co-workers left the building, as well as all the customers. The police got there two minutes later, and we let them handle the rest. They were able to get the man out and leave the building. We ended up being closed for the next hour or so, and finally opened a while later. That was by far the craziest thing that ever happened to me while working. This happened a few years ago. I used to work at Starbucks and was a part-time employee. This was during my first year in college, and I was back home for the summer. I was good friends with several of my co-workers, and I really enjoyed working there. One thing that happened, though, was really scary. It took place one night while I was closing. I was working with two of my co-workers, Sarah and Emily. Things were pretty busy until it started to get late. At that point, Sarah got off and went home, and it was just Emily and I for the last couple of hours. That was fine with me, though. Not many people came in at night. I believe we closed at around 8.30 or so. Emily and I worked until then, and then we closed up. I remember that after we locked the doors, we were doing some things we were supposed to do after closing. It was at this time when suddenly, we heard a knocking noise coming from the back door. That door was only ever used for deliveries, and of course it was locked. It was very strange, because we knew that nobody was supposed to be there right now. The knocking continued and got louder and louder until it turned into the sound of somebody banging on the back door. Emily asked if we should open it and see who it was, but I told her not to. I had a really bad feeling about this. I also wanted to know who was doing that, though, and for what reason as well. 
The banging went on for two minutes straight and then stopped altogether. We both felt relieved, but not for very long. Only a short while later, it started up again. The banging on the back door continued, and we had no way of looking out into that area unless we left the Starbucks building and went to look around. Obviously, I didn't think that would be a good idea, and neither did Emily. We just kind of waited inside for all this to stop. We looked out the main windows at the front of the building, but didn't see anything out of the ordinary. The parking lot was completely quiet, with only Emily and I's car in it. The pounding on the back door kept going for five minutes more, and then it stopped again for good. Emily and I finished up our work quickly and went to leave. We looked out the windows before, though, making sure that nobody was out there. We also waited a little while extra, just to be safe. We left the building and headed to our vehicles in the parking lot. We had parked right next to each other, and it was a pretty short walk. The Starbucks was in a little bit of a quieter area, though, and the parking lot was also very dark. I just remember that we had nearly made it to our vehicles when I began hearing a noise coming from the side of the building. We both looked over at the same time, and that's when we saw a man emerging from around the corner. He started heading in our direction immediately. Emily got inside her vehicle, and I followed and got inside mine. Emily's car was much closer to the man. I remember hearing her engine fire up, and she quickly backed away. After she did, I saw the guy start making a beeline right for me. I don't remember much at all of what he looked like. It was really dark and hard to tell many details. I quickly left and started backing out of there as well. The man remained in the parking lot, watching us leave. I'm not sure what his deal was. I don't know what he wanted either. He didn't try to break into the Starbucks or anything, and no other occurrences like that happened to me while I was working there. I still don't know what the guy was doing. I'm assuming he was the same person banging on the back door for minutes on end. I think he was trying to get us to open it for some reason. I'm glad that we decided not to, though. I used to work at home for my job, and when I did that, I would walk to Starbucks every day. It was a Starbucks I could walk to, and it would only take about 20 minutes. I would wake up, make the walk to Starbucks, then head back before work. It allowed me to get my steps in and also get my morning coffee. Well, I did this just about every day for about two or three months until something happened that caused me to stop altogether. It was a regular weekday and I left my house at 7 a.m. for the daily walk to Starbucks. The walk there went perfectly fine. I would take sidewalks the entire way there and back. Most of the roads were usually pretty quiet, but the two roads closest to it were a little bit busier. After I got there, I ordered my usual coffee and waited inside until it was done. The Starbucks was somewhat busy, with it being the morning and all. As I waited, I browsed around on my phone. Soon enough, my coffee was done. I took it and started to walk back. When I was about halfway home, I was walking on the left side of the road on a sidewalk. The street was a residential street, and it was a mixture of apartment buildings and housing. The street was a residential street, and there was a mixture of apartment buildings and houses. I remember that as I was walking, this car came down the street in the same direction I was going. It slowed down, and I expected it to pass me by but it didn't do so. It was a gray sedan and seemed sort of old. I'm not much of a car person though, so I don't know the exact year, make, or model. I noticed the car was traveling around the same speed I was walking. I didn't know why though. None of the people I knew had that kind of car, so I couldn't imagine it being one of my friends or something. As the car continued to go the same speed as me, I began to feel sort of nervous. 
After around 30 seconds of this, the car actually started to pull over to the side of the road, getting right in front of me. I wanted to get away from them. I had just passed a sidewalk that went between two apartment buildings to my left. As the car was pulling over next to me, I turned around and went down that side way. The car would have no way of following me down there. I just hoped that whoever was driving wouldn't get out and go after me or something. When I'd walked a decent ways between the buildings, I didn't hear anybody walking behind me or anything. I stayed hidden there for a little while, then went back. When I did, nobody was there, and the car was gone. After that, I kept going with my walk home. I made it back fine, and I didn't really know what to make of that whole situation. I was just glad the car didn't continue to follow me. For the next few days, I continued to walk to Starbucks every morning. I didn't let that one incident stop me. I didn't even consider not going. Sometime during the next week, though, I began to see the same car again. It was almost the exact same situation as before. I was walking down the same sidewalk on the very same street when I saw that car again drive a little past me. I thought to myself, not this again. When I saw it, I sped up and started walking quicker. The car maintained perfect speed with me. Again, I looked over and tried to see who was driving. I couldn't tell. Coming up ahead was the same sidewalk between buildings that I had gone down before. I got there and went down that same sidewalk again as I did before. I was almost all the way down, then went back hoping to see the car would be gone again, just like before. When I got to the corner and peeked around though, the car was still there. It was parked on the side of the road. I didn't see anybody around it on the sidewalk though. I didn't want to take any chances. I walked back down the sidewalk between the buildings. From there, I took another way home. It took a while longer, but I didn't see that car again for the rest of the day. After that, I really should have stopped walking to Starbucks every morning, but I didn't. I was stubborn. I kept going. The very next day, I walked to Starbucks without a problem. On the way back, I was careful to watch out for that vehicle. In fact, I took a separate way home from the road I had seen it on before. Eventually, I made it back to my street and to my house. Thing is, literally seconds after I got inside and closed the door, I saw that same car. It was now driving down my quiet street, traveling at a very slow speed. And the car did not stop at my house. It kept going, and when it was out of my sight, I kept watching the window. About a minute later, it came back around. Once more, it slowed down as it was passing my house. I tried to be careful so that whoever was driving wouldn't see me through the window. After that incident, I finally stopped walking to Starbucks. Luckily, the car has not approached my house since. I have a few theories of who it could be, but I don't know exactly. I think it may have been somebody who saw me at Starbucks, maybe multiple times. I suppose it also could have just easily been a random person, though, who followed me to my street. I don't know if they know exactly which house is mine, but I feel lucky that nothing bad happened to me. This is the story of the strangest sleepover I ever had. It takes place probably in 2009, when I was 12 years old. I could be wrong on the exact year, but that's around my best guess. I have an older sister who's three years older than I am, and she did a lot of activities growing up. She had a lot of friends, too. I remember that at one point she made a new friend. I don't even know where, and I don't remember the friend's name. It was through one of her many activities like dance or gymnastics or something. I just know it wasn't through school. I was told they didn't go to the same school. My sister went to this girl's house, maybe once or twice. 
I remember at one point my sister told me the girl had a brother around my age. She said he seemed kind of weird though. I didn't really think that much of it, but about a week later, my sister got invited to her house for a sleepover. I remember her asking my mom, and then my sister said that the girl's brother really wanted me to come and sleep over as well. Obviously, that confused me, because I had never met the kid. Seems strange to have your first meeting be at a sleepover. My mom asked me if I wanted to go. At first, I said I didn't really want to. I would rather stay home and play video games. But my mom told me that I might enjoy it and make a new friend. I decided to have an open mind and go with my sister. Who knows, maybe the guy would be really cool and we would end up becoming best friends. That Friday, my mom drove us to their house and dropped my sister and I off with my sister's friend. She lived kind of on the other side of town. We went inside and I met the kid, whose name was Luke. He seemed pretty normal to me at first. His parents were nice and so was his sister. After meeting everyone, our sisters went off on their own and I went into Luke's bedroom with him. While we were inside, he didn't really talk to me at all. I asked him a couple of questions, but all of a sudden he didn't seem that friendly. To be honest, he didn't seem like the kind of person I would be friends with anyway. We didn't have any of the same interests. I was really into sports and things like that, and he hated them. It was a bit of a letdown for me, but I thought maybe we would have some common ground somewhere. To be honest, the kid all of a sudden seemed like he didn't really want me to be there. It was kind of awkward. He wasn't saying anything, and we were both just looking around. Finally, Luke said we should go to the park. I thought that was a little bit odd, because the sun was already going down and was going to be setting soon. I said sure, though. He told me there was a cool park he went to all the time. We left his bedroom and walked down the hallway, then outside his house. I remember wondering if we should tell his parents we were leaving or something. Luke didn't seem too concerned about it, though, so I figured it would be okay. We walked down a street to the very end, then turned and walked down another street, we went down several more until we ended up walking 20 minutes. It was a lot farther than I thought it would be. When we got to the park, it was pretty standard. There was a spot with monkey bars and slides and stuff, and a little field with picnic tables. The whole thing was between several residential streets. After a few minutes there, Luke pointed to a tree a ways away and told me to go over there. He said there was something really cool waiting for me. I walked over to the tree, not really knowing why. When I got pretty far away, I asked him what was over there. He told me to look behind it, so I did. There was nothing there, though. It was just a random tree in the middle of the park. I looked back over at Luke and yelled, asking him what was supposed to be over there. When I looked over, though, I saw he was already running away. He quickly disappeared around the corner. I was so confused. I looked all around and the park was now completely empty. I walked over to where Luke had left the park. He was nowhere to be seen. I yelled his name as loud as I could several times, but I got nothing in response. By now, it was already dark out. I tried to remember the way we had come, but I really had no clue. I started walking in what I thought was the correct way. I would yell Luke's name here and there, but never got a response at all. I kept walking from one street to another. They were all residential and looked very similar. There were also lots of streets around. They were all very quiet. Soon it was pitch black out, and I had no clue where I was. I had no cell phone back then, so I wandered around random streets, hoping to get lucky and find Luke's house. I was walking around the streets for an hour at least. I was getting more and more worried the longer I was out there. Soon enough, I saw a gas station that was on a busier street about a block away. 
I had the idea to go there and see if I could use their phone. I went inside and asked the clerk if there was a phone I could use. She asked me what was going on. I told her what happened and she let me use her own personal cell phone. I called my parents. My mom came to the gas station and picked me up. She then called Luke's mom. Apparently Luke was already back home and had been there for quite a while. Luke had told his mom I just decided to go home. I left. I was really angry about this. I went home with my mom and played video games for the rest of the night. Looking back, I'm still mad at that Luke kid. I haven't seen him since, but he led me to the park and left me there, knowing I would have no idea how to get back. I really hope he's changed and is a better person now. I also think his parents didn't handle the situation very well. They didn't question it at all when he told them that I decided to leave all on my own. They should have at least called my parents or something. Anyways, it was a very strange experience to say the least. One time back in high school, my best friend Kenzie was going to sleep over at my house. I lived with my parents at the time, and I'm an only child. I remember that on this night, Kenzie had soccer until a little bit later. She played soccer in high school and was in some sort of sports league during the off-season. My parents both worked really early in the morning and usually went to bed at like 9 o'clock. After that, I would be the only one up. I was in my bedroom watching TV, and Kenzie got to my house at probably 9.30 or so. We then went upstairs to my room. It was a weekend, and we would stay over at each other's houses all the time on weekends. After Kenzie came up to my room, we talked for a little while. At probably 20 or so minutes after she got there, almost 10 p.m. or so, I heard the front door opening. It was downstairs, and we both heard it very clearly. Immediately, I got a bad feeling. I quickly tried to make sense of it. I figured that maybe my dad had gotten up for some reason. I didn't really know why he would go outside, though. We both stopped talking and listened in to the downstairs area. Shortly after the door opened, we both heard it close. We just barely could make out footsteps, as if somebody was sneaking around downstairs. Well, that couldn't be my dad. Plus, I would have surely heard him going down the stairs first if it was. I had no idea who it could be. Kenzie then told me that she thought she may have left the front door unlocked when she came into the house. I had left it unlocked for her to get in when she arrived. We quickly both became very nervous. We listened in and couldn't make out any more noises. After several minutes, I decided to look and see what was going on. I opened up my bedroom door quietly and tiptoed down the hallway. I peeked around the corner and down the stairs. I could see a portion kind of by the kitchen and front door. For a while, I didn't see anything, but suddenly, a man walked around the corner he wasn't looking at me, but as soon as I saw him come into my view, I jumped back and ran into my bedroom. I closed the door and grabbed my phone to call the police. I told Kenzie I had seen a random man down there. We both hid inside my bedroom closet and waited. We were just barely hidden in there. Eventually, I heard the front door open and close again. I was pretty sure the guy had left now whoever he was. I left my room and went down the hall to wake up my parents. I then ran back to my bedroom. We all waited in our rooms until the police got there. When they did arrive, the intruder was long gone. Nothing had been stolen, and nothing was even moved out of place either. It was very strange. Obviously, he had walked in because the door was unlocked, but I still don't know how he knew to go into our house specifically. Did he know the door would be left unlocked? And why did he even enter if he wasn't going to bother to steal anything? I don't know, and I may never know. Nothing like that ever happened again. 
It was years ago now, but I will never forget that night. I used to work at a smaller grocery store. I worked there for several years, from the time I was in high school all the way through college. The entire time I was there, I was just part-time. I got to know just about all the other employees, though. We only had about 10 to 15 total at once, because the store wasn't really that big. It only had three checkout lanes, and it would never get all that busy. The store was located on the edge, between a residential area and a more commercial district. I really liked working there. It was calm compared to the busier and more popular grocery stores. There were also a lot of regular customers, and I would get to know some of them as well. I was mostly just a cashier when I worked there. There was one terrifying experience that happened that I will never forget though. I was working from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m., which was also the time that we closed. It was a quiet night, and things were normal for the most part. That is, until some time after 8 o'clock. By that point, it was just myself and one other co-worker, a girl named Amanda. She was working in the back room of the store at the time, organizing some things. Some time after 8.30... A man entered the store. At that point, there were no other customers inside. Soon, he walked out of my line of sight. Some time went by, and I hadn't heard or seen the man at all. Nobody else came in either. It wasn't that unusual, but we were closing soon, and I was kind of hoping this guy would hurry up. I announced we would be closing in 15 minutes at 8.45, but still, I saw no signs of him. When 9 o'clock hit, he was still nowhere to be seen. I made the announcement that we were now closed, but there was no luck. From where I was, I really couldn't see a lot of the store, just the immediate area and part of the nearby aisles. After a few minutes, I decided I should go find the guy and let him know he had to leave now. I also wondered where Amanda was. Usually, when we closed, she would come out of the back room and we would leave together. She must have been finishing up. I got up from my checkout lane and started to walk through the aisles. I hadn't seen a single sign of the guy since he entered the store. Really, I hadn't heard anything either. It didn't take me very long to look through most of the aisles because the store wasn't all that big. When I had made it towards the back, I still hadn't seen any trace of the man. I thought maybe he'd left without me noticing. I just knew I would have noticed, though. The only entrance and exit to the store was right by the checkout lanes. If I didn't see him, I at the very least would have heard the doors opening. I knew he must still be in here somewhere. Wherever he was, though, I couldn't tell. I decided to go to the back room of the store to get Amanda, then we could both look together. The back room of the store was pretty typical. It ran along the entire back side. We kept extra products there, and that's also where we would get all our deliveries. I walked closer to the door, and when I was maybe 10 feet away from it, I felt my phone vibrate in my pocket. I stopped and took it out, and saw I had a new text from Amanda. It said I needed to get out of the store right now. I was confused when I read this, but before I could respond, I got another text, also from her. It said a man had come into the back room and tried to attack her. She'd fled, but he was still inside. I looked at the door to the back room, just ten feet away from me. I turned around and sprinted for the front of the store. I went out the exit and got outside. I ran for my car and jumped in. I called Amanda and she told me she had already called the police. They were on their way. I waited inside my car for five minutes until they showed up. I watched them enter the store, and about ten minutes later, they left with the man in tow. He had still been in there. He was hiding in the back room. I had never seen the man before that day. I didn't know why he came to our store, or what exactly his intentions were. 
After he went to the back room, I guess Amanda told him he wasn't supposed to be back there. He then approached her without saying a word and grabbed her. She struggled and was able to get away from him. He chased her to one of the doors leading outside, but when she left, he remained in the back room. If I had gone back there without knowing anything, I don't know what would have happened to me. I'm really glad that Amanda texted me when she did. This is something that happened a few years ago. I buy things on eBay here and there, and I've been doing so for years. I like to collect things like sports memorabilia, and occasionally I bid on auctions as well. One time I saw this autographed football that was signed by one of my favorite players. It had zero bids, and the starting bid was pretty low. I expected it to go way up. I entered my maximum bid and then moved on, thinking that maybe I'd have a shot at winning it. The auction still had several days left. Over the next few days, I actually forgot all about it. At that point, I got a notification saying that I had won the auction and I could pay for the signed ball now. When I looked, I couldn't believe it. Not a single other person had bid on the ball. I had won. I don't remember the exact price. I think it was maybe $10. It was worth a lot more than that. Needless to say, I was really excited. I paid the money the very next night. I was at home when my phone began to ring. During this time, I had a landline phone that I'd had for years. I didn't recognize the number on the caller ID, so I didn't answer it. What followed shortly after was a message. A man's voice came onto my answering machine, and he said that he was trying to reach me. He mentioned my name, and said I had won his football from the auction. Unfortunately, nobody else had bid on it. He said I was getting way too good of a deal, and it wasn't fair at all, but he was going to do me a favor and mail it anyways. He went on to say that he expected me to leave him a very good review. Now, this rubbed me the wrong way. I didn't like how he called me up on my personal phone to say this. I won the auction fair and square. If he didn't want the risk of somebody paying $10 for it, then he shouldn't have started the bidding so low. He knew the risks. I went on eBay and looked at other listings of the same item. They were going for a little over $50, so the guy had lost out on about 40 bucks. Obviously not that big a deal. Two days later, I received it in the mail. It was pretty fast. I guess the guy lived in the same state as me. After receiving the football, it was packaged well, and just how it looked online. I went on eBay to leave the good review the seller wanted so badly. To be honest, I really didn't want to after what he did. It kind of annoyed me. When I logged in, I saw he'd already left me a negative review. On eBay, sellers and buyers can leave each other reviews. You can leave it positive, negative, or neutral. People are less likely to buy or sell if you have a bad rating. Mine had been perfect to that point, and his was pretty good. His negative review of me was that I'd gotten too good of a deal. He was clearly very upset about this. I didn't feel it was fair of him to do that, though. What was I supposed to do? I bid and won. Did he expect me to pay more for no reason? It angered me, so I left him a bad review in return. I listed exactly what happened, including him calling my phone number and complaining. The next day, he called me again. I didn't answer, and he left me another message. This one much angrier. He berated me for three minutes straight. I didn't even listen to the whole thing. I just deleted it. This didn't stop him, though. He called me again several times the next day. I got frustrated. Luckily, I had call blocker installed on my landline. I blocked his number, so he would finally stop bothering me. For several days, everything was fine. Then, though, one night, I was at home when out of nowhere, I got a knock on my front door. I walked over, but before opening it, I looked outside. It was a man I didn't recognize at all. I had no idea why this random person would be here. 
I answered the door, and the man standing there mentioned my name and asked if that was me. I said yes, and he told me he was the seller of the football on eBay. When I heard that, I slammed the door in his face. This caused him to start attacking my door. I yelled at him to go away, or I would call the police. He was yelling, demanding I give him his ball back, saying I scammed him. I couldn't believe this guy. At this point, I wasn't even sure if he was really just mad about the ball, or if he was mad at me. He kept attacking my door. He didn't leave for ten minutes. I called the police on him, and when they arrived about ten minutes after that, the man was still there trying to get in. They spoke with him, and he gave his side of the story. I'm not even sure what that was, really. An officer came inside and spoke to me. He said the man outside kept claiming I'd scammed him and stolen something from him. I told the officer the whole story and showed him the proof on my phone. The police ruled in favor of me, at least in their opinion. They said I owned the football, and the man had to leave my property. They told him not to come back either. Eventually, the man did leave, and after that, I never heard from him again. I still have that football, and every time I look at it, I remember the crazy story that goes along with it. What is up guys, Blue Spooky here. Thank you guys so much for watching, especially if you made it this far to the end of the video. If you liked the video, please be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you feel so inclined. If you have any feedback for me as well, be sure to leave that in comments below the video. If you guys have a story you'd like to send in, or if you'd like to contact me for any reasons, there will be links to my social media in the description below the video, including my Facebook, Gmail, and Twitter accounts. Go ahead and send me a message on any of those, and I'll try to get to you as soon as possible. If you do decide to send in a story, please be sure to include in the tagline what the name of the story is if it has one, what type of story it is if it has one, and how you'd like to be credited in the description below the video. Please make sure to include as much detail as you feel comfortable with and try to use as much proper grammar as possible to make sure you have the highest chance of appearing in a future video. Overall, I think that's pretty much it for now, guys, so thank you so much for watching, and I hope you guys have a great day.